If you're a regular viewer to my channel, you'll definitely recognize this set, and if not, I'll put a link to it. It is the Bachman Coastliner set. Now, in that particular review, I was pretty hard on Bachman for basically putting almost no content to this set. Essentially, lacking nickel silver rail track and having just a basic circle with no straight sections in it for, well, a track layout, and pretty much no rolling stop, except for, I must admit, two very nicely detailed container cars. Even if they, much like the Caboose, lacked sprung couplers as well as metal wheels. As it turns out, my criticisms appear to have been justified, as many of you who've watched this video agreed with me that this set essentially was far too expensive for what it included, especially the fact that it only had a single basic ring of track for the astonishing price of, wait for it, $240. Now, while it, of course, is always possible to get this set a little cheaper if you're willing to go to a hobby shop or perhaps hit eBay and try to find a damaged repair set that you can get for a good price or, quote-unquote, an open box set, that price is clearly somewhere over the astral planes for something this limited in content. And all of this is before we even begin to discuss the limited quality that the locomotive possesses. It lacks flywheels, has a very buzzy slash whiny motor, still utilizes wheel wipers, and... It really is just all built to a very low quality standard. In any case, one of my viewers commented about this particular train set, the Thoroughbred. He said that the train set actually cost less than the CSX Coastliner, and yet somehow or other managed to include two extra sections of track. I was intrigued by this comment and had to check it out, of course, and found that yes, in fact, this train set does have a full retail price less than the CSX Coastliner. And so, after I found this one on eBay for a very reasonable price, I decided to buy it and see exactly how Bachman managed to achieve getting the price down, at the same time increasing the content of the train set. First impressions, well, the box is quite small, typical of an entry-level small Bachman train set. Although, again, we do see that sort of hard-to-read at this point little track graph showing it actually having a full loop with a straight section of piece in it. I would also like to take this opportunity to point out that this train set is for people 14 years and older. It is not a toy, as with all the products I review on this channel. We also see on the back of the train set, much like Bachman always seems to do these days, showing off what you could do with this train set if you were willing to spend some more money and get more tracks. But I have to admit that layout, second from the left right over there, is the one I would love to build one of these days. Not this one, I'm zooming in on the uh, one right above it. Yeah, that one right up there, that's the one I'd like to build, yeah. <laughs> and while I do acknowledge that Bachman does give you a whole two extra straight sections with this train set, I can't help but feel like Oliver Twist begging for seconds. As we zoom out on the box, we also note that the set is again equipped with the infamous plastic sprung couplers and, of course, the usual Bachman speed controller. It also gives us a brief description of the rolling stock included, and particularly the gondola car, the hopper car, and the all-wheel drive equipped AMD F7 model. And last but certainly not least, a caboose. Turning back over to the front of the box, we get the usual tantalizing glimpses of the actual rolling stock, including the very well painted, I might add, AMD F7 locomotive in the Norfolk Southern paint scheme. I have to admit the paint scheme alone is tempting me to see if I can install DCC in this particular locomotive. Anyway, that's enough background. Let's go ahead and get her open and see what she has inside. As we can see, like most Bachman train sets, this particular set is equipped with basically a two-box internal design. One box contains the rolling stock, the other box contains the actual track, as well as the power packs, aka speed controller, and the wires for it, including the track power wire and the actual power pack that plugs into the wall. Let's first get the meat and potatoes that set out, which is of course the rolling stock, and take a good look at everything. Oh, again, that Norfolk Southern F7 is tempting me like crazy. Bachman really did a good job of painting this thing. Now let's also go and remove the track pack from the actual box itself to see what we have. Now again, admittedly, this is one of my bargain hunting specials, so we see the track is, well, <laughs> less than perfect shape. While it is very clear someone has been here before me, I knew that when I bought this set. The most notable thing I discovered now was that the plastic was being used to hold those tracks in place, that sort of cellophane plastic they were wrapped in, instead of the usual tie-down straps included with the box, which stuns me as it really isn't that hard to put them back into place, and I don't know why you wouldn't do that. Anyway, moving on, let's get the tracks out of the box and start to get this layout assembled. I also will note that this train set has the obligatory safety instructions, 
And of course, no Bachmann train set would be complete without the usual Bachmann speed controller. Although this particular model has been cheapened, it, as I'll explain a little bit later as I actually start to assemble this thing up. As you can see, it also includes the very famous and very useful Bachmann track connecting wire thing. Now let's take a look at the rolling stock in detail. Again, that F7 locomotive, I don't know what it is, just a tracksuit with this crazy Norfolk Southern paint scheme. I initially wondered if this was Bachman taking some liberties in terms of realism, something the company, at least in terms of paint schemes, usually avoided. However, as it turns out, they did in fact exist in this paint scheme for Norfolk Southern. The company wound up acquiring a total of four of these type F units to pull their fleet of 20 plus office special cars on office special runs around the country. These acquisitions took place sometime in the mid-2000s. The four units were built the GP38-2 standards to simplify training as well as improve efficiency for the units. Unfortunately, as early as 2007, a new administration was in charge and these units were notably absent from pulling the office car specials. The company decided to simply use some of its modern freight locomotives in heritage paint schemes to pull their office car specials. This was possible because the company now had a generator car that could be placed on the office car special and power the coaches, not requiring a passenger type head unit to actually handle the hotel or HEP power to keep the lights and heating and air conditioning working in these cars. The paint scheme again kind of jumped out on me because I didn't realize they existed. The nice little job with the portholes there and I really liked that horse on the front of the engine. Unfortunately, it was at that point I began to realize this was just Bachmann as usual. It's the same traditional F7 or F unit made by Bachmann with the same cheap silver horns and all the other annoying details creeping out. We also find that the pickup system is the same archaic blah blah blah, I know, wheel wipers to pick up all the power. These again will cause problems in the long run and well, you've heard me say this a million times but I'll say it again, will require more maintenance than axle bearing pickups. We also note the lack of detail on the base of the locomotive and of course the rather infamous Bachmann locomotive adorning it. I will note in all fairness to this locomotive it does in fact have the sprung knuckle couplers which is something I can't say for the gondola car as I struggle to pull it out here. Again typical with Bachmann train sets there have been a lot of corners cut to keep the price down. While I will easily and freely admit that the weight of this car is pretty decent as well as the paint scheme on it, that's about as far as I can go. As we can see, the car is yet again adorned with the infamous plastic sprung couplers which have failed and of course the infamous plastic wheels. And here's a close-up on what I'm talking about on those couplers. They've actually been forced open another 80 degrees as they're not supposed to be. And yeah, you can't actually pop them back in place without breaking the plastic spring, which essentially has already happened. The coal load on this particular car is supposed to be removable, but I, for some reason, could not get it free no matter how many times I tried to get it loose. It just seems like it was maybe pasted in there. Again, I'm not sure of this particular set's heritage before I got hold of it. I was told it was pretty much new open box. So that could be the issue. But again, I was unable to get the coal load out of that particular car, so I decided to give up before I damaged anything. Next, we move on to the gondola car, and there isn't really much to be said here. This is the same gondola car that Bachmann has included in its sets all the way back till the 80s. How do I know? Because, well, my first Bachmann set, which I received in the 80s, had one of these very same cars. The main difference is it had truck-mounted horn-hook couplers. This one features body-mounted knuckle couplers. And yet again, they are in fact the plastic sprung couplers, and once again broken. And yes, again, as with the other cars in this set, it again has plastic wheels, not metal wheels. It does feature a pretty nice brake wheel on the end. That's a nice little detail to put in there. And last but certainly not least is the caboose. And it is a Norfolk and Western caboose. But make no mistake about it, yet again, this is a very crude model of a caboose. There is almost no ripping or detailing on the outside. The most outstanding thing is that it actually has the Norfolk Southern logo on it. I'm wondering if that isn't how or why Bachmann, I should say, didn't try to jack the price up just because of this. We can see this unit is missing the little chimney on the top there, and the front and end railings are a bit crinkled. But again, there isn't much to be said. It has plastic wheels and the infamous plastic sprung couplers. Now let's move on to assembling the layout itself, and hallelujah, there we have our two straight sections, something I guess we need to be very happy that Bachmann included, because again, the basic sets they usually have just have a simple circle, circle of track without any straight sections, period. Nothing but curves. Again, there's nothing to go crazy about here. These are steel alloy, and again, as I'll try to show, and I don't know how well this will come up, they are in fact 18-inch radius curves, which in the American standard and slash Canadian standard of tracks, these are very tight. I think that's equivalent to the British first radius curves. Most equipment is designed to operate on a 22-inch radius curve, which we're talking about your Amfleet coaches, your standard heavyweight coaches. And again, of course, we see that they are very clearly made by Bachmann. 
Anyway, with all that background out of the way, let's go ahead and start assembling the actual layout itself. Again, there isn't much to this. Carefully line the tracks up, make sure the rail joiners are aligned, and then gently apply pressure to snap them together. Once I've successfully joined the track together, I'll run my finger over the actual joining area where the fish plates and or rail joiners are to ensure there's a smooth connection. Again, a bump at this point can send a train flying off the tracks. Anyway, I won't bore you with the rest of this process as it's a little bit on the repetitive side, to put it mildly, and at least somewhat boring. So let me speed this up there for you. Now before I go any further and hook up the power to the tracks and get the speed controller all set, I'm going to deal with the coupler issue. As you see, I'm going to be using these Easy Mate Mark II couplers to replace the broken couplers on those two cars. These are medium center shank, as they're referred to as, meaning a medium length shaft, and they are mounted in the center of the coupler knuckle itself, and they of course feature an actual coupler spring, not a plastic ABS knockoff. To install them, we first have to remove the trucks, actually, believe it or not. This is a bit of an involved procedure, and admittedly made a little bit more complicated by this design. We need to actually remove the truck or bogey from the car itself to gain access to the coupler box so we can pull the old coupler out. We do this by utilizing a Phillips head screwdriver. To remove the truck's retaining screw. With the screw removed, we now can take the actual coupler box off. Again, we need the same Phillips head screwdriver. I'll be able to use the same one for this job as well. This is a very small screw, so it is very critical we keep careful track of it, as they tend to disappear everywhere, including the carpet, which is, well, not a recommended place to actually do this, but it's what I had available. Once we have the screw out, it's out we can pull the old coupler out of place and set up the new coupler to go in its place. Again, I strongly recommend against using the carpet as your work area, but this is what I may do with it, and luckily I did not lose that screw, but please note this tiny little screw is easy to lose and almost impossible to replace. The new coupler in place and the old coupler box back in place, we simply place the screw back where it was before, insert the screwdriver, and turn it clockwise to secure the screw back into its location. It's also critical we get the box right. Again, the two dots go on the top, the single dot goes on the bottom as bizarre as that whole assembly looks. This is because there are two little points that actually hold the box in position and properly locate the coupler spring. If they're out of place, the coupler will not be able to move correctly or at all. With the coupler now safely secured, it's time to put the truck or bogey back into place. To do this, we simply place the screw inside the truck assembly itself, assuring that the open part of the frame of the truck is actually facing up, because again, there's only one way it'll go in. If it's in backwards, the truck will not rotate and or move back and forth correctly, and there'll be a height issue. So you'll kind of know this when you put it in position. There's only one way this goes in. Once the truck is properly aligned, we simply place the screw in position, and then insert the screwdriver and turn in a clockwise manner again to secure the screw and tighten the truck into place. We simply repeat this procedure to replace the other coupler. Next, we'll hook up the Bachmann Speed Controller. Again, it's pretty simple. There's a two-track plug and a power pack plug on the back here. We connect the two-track plug, which is this red cable right here, to the two-track plug as such. Again, it only has one plug that will accept it, as the transformer plug on the opposite side is a completely different style. Anyway, we plug it right into the two-track plug, and that takes care of that. Next, we'll hook up the transformer plug itself. This, again, plugs into the out to wall plug. We simply put it right in place onto that plug, much like we did to the two track plug, and whammo, that's all connected. Please note the transformer is not plugged into the wall at this point and should not be. With the connections made to the speed controller or power pack itself, it's now time to connect the power pack or controller up to the track itself. We simply place the plug itself into the, re into the terminal derailleur and push it into position. It takes a little force to snap it in, but that is very reassuring. Again, installing this plug upside down only affects the direction the train travels in, and that's it. Next, we'll rerail the locomotive. To do this, we simply run it gently across the terminal derailleur track until the wheels fall into position, and we stop feeling thumping or resistance from the wheels themselves. Repeat the same procedure for the two freight cars, the gondola and the hopper, as well as the caboose, to get them on the track. To engage the couplers, we simply push the cars gently together with the locomotive and each other. The couplers engage automatically.
Now with all the trains on the tracks and the couplers coupled, it's time to now plug the transformer into our power source, which in this case is out of sight. And now I must inform and or update you on some cost cutting that was unfortunately done to this version of the power pack slash speed controller. This version no longer locks itself into an off position when you turn the throttle below the lowest level it goes, so you have to make sure you physically turn it down all the way when you initially power the train on so it doesn't take off by itself. Once we're sure we have all the connections made correctly and the train is on the track correctly, we can gently advance the throttle and watch our train take off. Again, we note the audible whine from the locomotive and the drive system in general. This is again not a very refined locomotive and we're reminded immediately that this is a bit of a cut rate product. We also note a tendency for the engine to surge a little bit here and there, and that the noise actually gets worse as we advance the throttle. As you can see, due to the cheap drivetrain and the addition of this new type cheap motor Bachmann isn't putting in its locomotives, the way this set runs is nothing to write home to mom about. As we can see here, the same can be said about its ability to run very slow or crawl. It's a very jerky affair with the locomotive surging and changing speeds on its own without me adjusting the throttle period. It also takes an excessive amount of throttle to get the locomotive to start moving, causing it to suddenly take off. The cheap motor installed in this locomotive simply requires an excessive amount of voltage to spin over correctly. We also hear that this is a rough runner. Again, this is down to the cheap drivetrain Bachmann puts in its sets. And yes, before anyone asks, I have put the locomotive through a proper break-in run. And now let's take a look underneath the hood of the locomotive and see why this train set runs the way it does. The paint itself is well applied, with the gold on black on white having a high contrast between the colors and it really does pop. But looking underneath we can see that it's basically standard issue Bachmann. I do however like this little horse logo on the front of the engine that really does stick out. I like how they did that. Unfortunately we can also find areas where corners were cut. For example the ditch lights on the bottom which are supposed to be there in the actual real life model have been simply painted on. They're not realistic and they look kind of tacky against everything else. I should also note the number boards do not illuminate at all, That's as is typical with most Bachmann locomotives. Anyway, let's get under the hood. To do so, we need to remove these four screws, two of them behind or in front of each of the trucks, depending upon which side of the locomotive you're talking about. Again, we need a skinny Phillips head screwdriver to access these holes, with a long shaft, as well as a lot of force, as these screws appear to have been over-tightened by the factory, this appears to have been called by the clutch resistance settings on the factory screwdrivers set to a resistance level that's too high, causing the screws to get overdriven. Once we've successfully removed all four screws, we can gently lift up on the shell to remove it. We need to be careful not to damage the front nose piece as that front coupler is still in place. One should really remove this to be perfectly safe, but in my case I decide to leave it attached as I just be honest, didn't want to be bothered removing that coupler and replacing it again after I was done.
Under the hood, it's the same old, same old. Here we go again. A very cheap Bachman motor, which I believe this is even a three-pole, with no flywheels hooked in directly to, sh to the shafts that actually drive the worm gears themselves. The worm gears, again, do not have covers on them and are buried underneath these two metal assemblies in the front, which require you to release two screws to have them actually drop off. It's kind of hard to see, but there are no covers on these. As I mentioned before, this locomotive utilizes wheel wipers for pickups, not axle bearings, as is typical for Bachmann's. Unfortunately, it has another typical feature, and that is these infamous white plastic gears that are known for shearing, cracking, and otherwise causing utter misery, leading to rough running and or complete failure of the locomotive to function until they're replaced. This is something Bachmann really needs to get a handle on. Unfortunately, it appears that Bachmann has taken this step in the exact opposite direction, further cheapening these models with even cheaper motors and all-around shoddiness in terms of how everything is put together. Anyway, as I reassemble this model, it's now time to talk turkey. Now, as I mentioned before, and at the start of this video, I should say, the CSX Coastliner set went for about $250 with all before taxes as for retail from Bachmann. This set, however, is a little bit more palatable, selling for, wait for it, that's right, $165. Now, it's very interesting that Bachmann was able to increase the content of a train set and at the same time reduce the price or sell it for a lower price. Now, that said, the prices have jumped on this particular model train set. As we can see by this shot of the company's 2018 catalog, the price was all the way down of those days to $145. Again, that is full retail from Bachmann. You could probably find it a little bit cheaper in your local hobby shop at the time. And as we can see now, that price has shot up to $165. What's most disturbing about this whole thing is that, well, despite the price increase, nothing has cha nothing has improved. In fact, things have gone downhill with a cheaper power pack and the infamous cheap motor being installed on the locomotive itself. So while I can conclude that this set is certainly better value for your money, especially when compared with the coastliner set the company markets, it's done so with a pretty big penalty. And it really doesn't have much to show for itself. And in the end, all Bachmann did was cut the quality and jack the prices up. A disturbing trend the company seems obsessed with lately. And that's going to do it for this video. If you liked it, thumbs up. If not, thumbs down. Please subscribe and thank you again for watching. And as always, keep the metal side, which is your wheels, down on the track.